This is Crystal Perez. Today is January 20th, 2012. I'm interviewing Susan Weissman Shields in Sandy Springs, Georgia for the DeKalb History Center. Mrs. Shields is the daughter of Harry Weissman, superintendent at the Honor Farm. During which years did you and your family live on the farm? My parents moved down in the spring of 1941 with my brother who was two years old. And daddy retired. I suppose in the split, retired in 61, so it was probably in the spring or earlier, after January 1st of 61. Okay, so you were born here. I was born here. My brother was born in this family. And you were born while your parents were living on the honor farm? Yes. Never lived anywhere else until I went to college. Well, we moved when Daddy retired. Okay. Please live, Please describe your living conditions on the farm. Okay, I would say they were better than average for for that area of DeKalb County, we lived in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom, two-full-bath brick house um, with uh, a formal living room, fireplace, a uh, formal dining room, an eat-in kitchen, a very large front porch that was screened in, uh, and a beautiful foyer, very large foyer. And uh, two back porches, a screened in back porch, and then another open back porch, and a full basement with a separate room if you wanted to have a maid. No bathroom down there. All the laundry facilities were in the basement. And then we had a two car freestanding garage. Okay. There was also a formal uh, flower garden in the back. I mean, a formal one. Mm hmm. This was where we put vegetables in. Okay, so you did your own farming as well. Well, Mama planted flowers and we grew carrots and, you know, hot peppers and stuff like that. Right. Now, what status would you say um, your family occupied, for instance? Would you say you were middle class? I would say we were middle class. I have no idea how much money Daddy made because it was on a G rating. Um, we did have to pay rent to the government for the house. I have no idea, no idea how much they had to pay. I don't know what Daddy made from beginning to end. Uh, we, I'm assuming that water and electricity was included in that rent. I have no idea. I know when the county power went out, ours did, too. No, it didn't. I don't remember. But anyway, um, it was a dirt road, and that was it. There were five other houses, four other houses around, and all the people that were in those houses worked on the farm. Okay, would you say that middle class would be, um, would characterize the whole community there at Panthersville? No. Panthersville was a dairy community, uh, I would say. I'm not going to go with class, I'm going to say low income except for a few people uh, who were big property owners from way back in Pathersville. There were more dairy farms in Pathersville in that area of DeKalb County than I believe anywhere in the southeast. I may be wrong there. Jack Mathis knows the answer to that. Uh, but it was mainly people that had dairy farms or regular farms or had blue collar type jobs. There were very few what we would call well to do people that lived in the Okay. Um, you went to Southwest DeKalb, I went to correct? Southwest. Yes. Okay. And did the students there know that you lived on the honor farm? Oh, farms? yeah. Everybody knew we lived on the farm. Uh, there was no problem with kids coming to visit or this sort of thing. Mother had um, Easter egg hunts for my brother's classes um, for several years because we had the biggest yard. It was about an acre, if not more, with lots of trees, so we'd have the Easter egg hunts at our house, and um, there was no problem with people coming and going back and forth because the public road went through the farm, so it was no problem at all. Okay, what about other family members? All of our family was from the north, Pennsylvania and New York, so they would come on, if they were on vacation, they would come down and visit, you know, for a week or so, and then they would go back, or we would go up there, but okay. there wasn't a, a 
back and forth family because it was too hard to drive then. It took three days to drive from New York to, to Atlanta. Too far. No <laughs> expressway. So it seems like they didn't have a problem with coming to the Honor Farm and what it was about. Oh, no, that. because most, all of Daddy's family were New York City, like New York City, you right. know, Manhattan, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Well, it was mainly the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens. They just thought it was cool, you know, that they were all, Daddy's brothers, two brothers were pharmacists. Um, two brothers, yeah, two brothers were pharmacists. One was an executive with the book company. And his sister, uh, one worked for the city uh, as a secretary. The other one was the director of school curriculum in Manhattan, or one of the bars. And all of a sudden, they had a brother who was a farmer. They thought it was cool. <laughs> How would you describe um, the layout of the farm? Okay, the layout, there were like about 13, 1,400 acres. I thought it was 23, but I get the amount of acres we had mixed up with the amount of pigs that we had. Um, you came through the, the gates to the farm on Pinkersville Road, and there were two houses on the left, uh, our house and uh, the guy that was in charge, I remember, the guy who was in charge of the beef home. There were three houses on the right where the dairyman, the assistant farm manager, and the um, the dairyman who was in charge of the barns and the milk house. And then there was the assistant farm manager lived in the middle house, and then the um, swine herdsman lived in the third house. As you went farther on down Pathisville Road on the right hand side, uh, there was an officer's quarters for the unmarried officers, some of them who were at the main prison on McDonough and maybe one or two that were out that were on the, on the farm. Uh, I've never been in that building, so I have no idea what it looked like. But it was officer's quarters, is all I know. On the left-hand side was a great big dormitory-like building where the prisoners lived. I was never in that building. As you went past the dormitory, there was Daddy's office. It was a little complex of buildings, maybe one or two. Daddy's office was there. And then behind the office were, I think, three uh, dairy barns for milking with flower beds in between. And um, then across from that, on the other side next to the officer's quarters, there was the dehydrator and the silos. Then as you went down Pantheswell Road, that was all the buildings there as you went farther down Pantheswell Road, you turned right on Clifton Springs, went over Doolittle Creek, which was fun to wait in. And uh, there was a little road that veered off Doolittle off Clifton Springs Road that led to the piggery, which was a beautiful structure. And that's where all the pigs were. And that was it, as far as I can remember. Now, if there were any buildings behind the buildings I've described, I don't know, because I never went back there. Did your mother, did your mother work outside of the home? My mother worked part-time just for fun. Um, after we started school, after we were, I was in high school, she worked at, uh, she did some substitute teaching for DeKalb County. And she also uh, worked in a dress shop once in a while, not all at once, but, you know, a dress shop. And she worked at Board's Flowers basically off and on until she was in her mid-80s. Okay. Did you have any cats or dogs on the farm or any type of pet? We had a cat. They didn't allow dogs because of the emotional um, attachments that, farm, that the prisoners could get to dogs. Cats weren't that social. And uh, I think Daddy had to get special permission for us to have a cat. And we had a cat. And where would you do your shopping for clothes or groceries? Okay, clothes. I think we would pick up, if we needed something little, we would go to uh, Decatur, to Belks. But the big shopping for towels and real clothes and all that shopping, spring shopping and fall shopping for school was all done downtown in Atlanta. Uh, groceries were in downtown Decatur, which is about six or seven miles, I guess. Uh, and then Somewhere in the 50s, they built some inter something at the intersection of Camel Glenwood, and then there was a grocery store there. But Mother went to the A&P in the for the groceries. Okay, and how often would you all go to the city? 
Well, we went every Friday night for temple services at the temple on Peachtree Street. And I would say um, maybe we would go downtown shopping maybe four or five, the most six times a year. We had a big sale. Mother and I would be opening the doors at Riches. And um, maybe once a month we would go downtown to the movies during the day, like to one of the big theaters, uh, the Fox, Paramount, Lowe's, the big ones. And then went to regular movies like Cowboy Shoot 'em Ups, Daddy would take us to Little Five Boys and Kirkwood. And that was about it. Maybe we'd go out to dinner once or twice a year downtown, but very rarely did we ever go out to dinner. Usually it was in conjunction with going to the movies, and then we'd go to some cool place. Yeah. Right. Um, did your family use farm products no. for personal consumption? No, nothing was used. It was totally for the government. Okay. Uh, the only thing that was ever used at the house was since there were flower beds between the uh, dairy barns, the farm, the, the guys would bring flowers to mother that they had picked from the flower garden. That is the only thing that ever came to the house. Okay, so the community members mm -hmm. wouldn't purchase anything from the farm? You couldn't because it was from the government. There, was, okay. there wasn't any way. Okay. What types of crops do you remember were grown? Okay. Um, Definitely alfalfa, corn for the cows. Um, I think behind the piggery, there was sweet potatoes. I'm not too sure that was for the, for the pigs mainly, you know. Um, and uh, I remember, by not by accident, but Daddy planted kudzu because it was when kudzu got really popular. And uh, he would put the cows in the kudzu, and they loved it. But then he realized, you know, it's hard as the dickens to get rid of kudzu. Mm -hmm. But I think he finally got rid of it. But I don't remember. They might have raised soybeans. I'm not too sure about soybeans. I just remember corn and alfalfa. Okay, do you remember the type of livestock that were on the Oh, corn? yeah. Oh, yeah. They had dairy cows when we first moved there. Dairy cows and pigs. And then Daddy hired a guy who worked, who was from out west. A real, I mean, he was a Cherokee Indian from Oklahoma. I was so excited. And he came, Daddy went when we were pretty young. I can't remember. I was maybe seven or eight, something like that. He went to Chicago and he bought Angus cows because he wanted to have beef on the, on the property. And bless his heart, he rode with them in the cattle car because he wanted to make sure they were okay. <laughs> I remember that. He, I mean, he smelled terrible when he got him, but he, he rode with them. He didn't ride them on regular trail. And he had a herd of dairy cows, and then they got a horse only because the guy from Oklahoma, his name was Joe Ben Palmer, I remember just as Roy Rogers as they came, <laughs> did not want to herd his cows with a truck. Okay. And so they let him keep a horse on the farm just for him to ride. He could ride, he could rope, he could, he could lasso. In fact, when his son... They had a little boy when they moved in. His son looked at our cat, which he had never seen a cat before. I guess his little son was maybe two. And he called it, he thought it was a doggy. He called it a doggy, like a little whore, a little cow. Mm -hmm. But that was exciting because we had a real cowboy on the farm. That's cute. No chickens, nothing like that. Do you remember any types of farm equipment that was on the Oh, yeah, farm? everything. You know, they had balers when people were still baling their hay by hand. Daddy had mailers and uh, combines, all the big stuff that you use on the farm. And, uh, and there were a lot of trucks, you know, pickup trucks, dump trucks, garbage trucks. Uh, just the regular big farm machinery, thrashers or threshers, whatever they're called. They didn't do any of that outside by hand stuff. It was all machine. Okay, so it's a pretty modern farm. Oh, it, yeah. Cause, well, I think, yeah. Yeah, because Daddy has his degree in that. He, you know, yeah, it was very modern. 
Was the farm isolated or was it visited often by members of the community? Well, they had to go through it. You know, the road went right through it. There weren't tours, if that's what you mean. There were no tours. Okay. The only time I think there may have been a tour is when somebody from Washington came down and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and wanted to go to the farm, but there were never any tours. That would, um, I don't know what kind of rule they had, but knowing my daddy, he would have felt that it was going to affront the prisoner's dignity. Right. That makes sense. Um, what surrounded the farm? Were there any community structures around the farm? Around the farm? <laughs> around the perimeter of the farm? That you could see South from the farm? No. No, because it was the country. Okay. South East Camp High School was up the street. Mm-hmm. Um, no, there were dairy farms. There was one farm that adjoined the prison farm um, that was a dairy farm. It was a friend of ours, and we're still friends. The daughters, well, one of the daughters died. And, uh, but no, there was nothing adjoining it. It was all country. There were no houses that I remember after. There were no houses on Panthers Road. Does it run into Waldrop Road? Panthers Road runs into Waldrop. I don't remember. I mean, we're I talking to everybody. Way. It was all country. Okay. It was all farms and country. Well, you couldn't really, unless you were a good walker, you mm-hmm. couldn't walk from one place to the other. And the, the only structures that I remember was the high school and the fairgrounds behind it and the dairies. Okay. There, now, there's a couple of landfills in the area. Were they in existence while no. you were there? Did you notice? No. no. Okay. And what is your perception of life on the farm for the inmates? Well, considering that they were in prison, you know, I don't think they were the happiest. They knew that it was a major honor to be able to work there or to go there. So remember, this was federal prison, not state. So they had done federal crimes, and you had to be more than a trustee um, before you could come to the farm. You had to be just... It it was a major honor to be able to come to the farm. There were no guards, as far as guards are concerned. There were no guns on the farm. Uh, The only fences were for the animals. And uh, the the prisoners could basically come and go as they pleased. And they were what trustees. They were trusted. And I think that they, considering that they were in jail, that they considered it such an honor that... Cute. <laughs> they considered it an honor to be able to work out there because they did have so much for you. Right. Now, I know that you were not allowed in their area or in the dorms or anything. Yeah. Were you able to get any type of a feel for their conditions just by looking? Do you think that they had pretty comfortable conditions? Yeah, I don't even know if, they, if the dorms were open or if they had, I know they didn't have cells. Okay. Uh, this is going to sound more elegant. Daddy wouldn't have allowed, allowed any conditions to be substandard. Okay. Um, you know, they still, I know they slept on prison cots and maybe they had bunk beds. We had a set of bunk beds in our basement that were made out of metal. I think it was the same thing with real mattresses. Um, I would say the conditions were very good. The, the food I know was very good. I never saw anybody starving to death. And, um, and so, like, the milk that came from the farm, they didn't just serve it there. It had to be pasteurized and all that. And then it was sent to the prison. It was, it was sent to the prison downtown and it was, you know, all that. So uh, they were well fed and they were clean. I never saw anybody without, when the weather got cold, they all had on coats and hats and mittens and gloves. If it was raining, Daddy didn't have them out there working on the rain. The only time that I remember Daddy really rushing on it was when we knew rain was coming and he had to get the hay in. And he wanted to get it in before the hay got wet, because then it ruined. Right. Uh, Were you able to see the visiting area that the inmates had, or could you view them while they were visiting with family and friends? No. I know that that they were allowed in the summer, you know, in, when nice weather came, the families would come, or whenever the families would come to visit. I was totally off limits to them. Uh, 
I would see children occasionally playing in the front yard of the dormitory. I was never allowed off campus or road. It never even dawned on me. It was, um, you know, that, that messed up, that uh, infringed on their privacy and their dignity, right. their family time. Right. I wasn't allowed. Do you know some of the activities that they perform during the day? Um, like what their typical work day consisted of? I know they got up, they had breakfast, and they all had their assignments. Some probably worked in the, in the dairy, and some worked in the piggery, and some worked on the farm machinery uh, to plant and plow and all that stuff. You know, I, I don't know what they did while all, with all of them during the day. All right. Yeah. And you said earlier that your your father wouldn't have allowed them to have substandard living conditions. No, he wouldn't. So I assume that means that they were treated pretty fairly. They were treated more than fairly. Really treated more than fairly. Daddy believed in the dignity of uh, of, of other people. Right. And since they were, they, they would do anything to get on the farm because they knew how they, they wanted to, to go to the farm. Right. And uh, Daddy didn't use that, that feeling that they had. So they were happy when they got And they liked him. If they didn't like him because he was the manager, at least they respected him tremendously. Right. Um, do you think the farm was an appropriate alternative to the main penitentiary? Oh, yeah. At, at that time, we had a different, they, they had a different kind of prison. You know, we didn't have, we, we didn't have, you know, these gangsters and, and, and child molesters and that sort of thing. There were bootleggers and racketeer guys and uh, people that, a, a tremendous amount of bootleggers, just a tremendous amount. And they, as Daddy said, they could make booze out of a table leg. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was just a, yeah, they liked it. I forgot what your question was. <laughs> I was asking if you thought it was an appropriate alternative to the main penitentiary. Oh, I do. For some people. Right. You know, it was, a, it was an area that needed to have people there. And these people knew what an honor it was to be able to go onto the farm. So you think that the people who chose the inmates that were going to the honor farm did a good job of choosing the appropriate inmate? Yeah. And they didn't necessarily have to be farmers to be chosen to go because they learned what they learned how to do. Right. Now I know that you didn't, you weren't allowed to have contact with them, but did you? Did you able? Did, were you able to see if there was a change in some of them between when they got there and when they left? No. Now I did have some contact with them. The people that cut the grass and did the yard work were all prisoners. The people that picked up our garbage were prisoners. If the house needed painting or repair needed something done, they were there. And there was. Uh, <laughs> You know, so it wasn't like I didn't have any contact with them. As far as rehabilitation, um, I only can think of a couple that, that came back. And I mean, came back into the prison system. Right. So, in general, would you say that the Honor Farm was a successful rehabilitation program? Yeah. More than in general, 100%. I don't know how it was after Daddy left, because Daddy was special. I mean, he really was. Really special. Uh, I called all the prisoners Mr. Uh, except one, who was our yard man. His name was Sandy. And I think Sandy liked to write bad jokes. <laughs> and Sandy had been in prison so many times apparently that when he got out, he would do something to get back in. And then he would immediately say, I want to go to the farm and daddy was there. And, you know, because I remember we had Sandy at least twice, twice back then. Because a lot of prisoners can't make it on the outside. Uh, and, uh, but I remember Sandy, but everything else, it was Mr. This, and Daddy called them Mr. He never called them by their first name. Um, he gave them respect, and in turn, they gave him respect. I know one guy came to the house. Uh, 
after he had been let go, you know, like three or four years later, and knocked on the front door and wanted to see Daddy and thank him for everything he had done for him when he was in jail and for in, in prison. And Daddy you know, went out. He was very nice to him. Never let him in the house and just told him that he appreciated it. But it was a no-no. You could not come back. And Christmas cards were sent to Daddy, and um, he never answered them because she just didn't communicate on a right. personal or social level like that. He was very good at keeping the, 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 the mountains were real tall and there wasn't a lot of space between them, but it was real deep. Right. Yeah. Were you ever concerned about your safety on the farm? No. No. Uh, I felt really safe. What about the other staff members of the farm, like the foreman, the veterinarian, and the physician? Well, no, there were no veterans. There were no there were veterinarians. No Daddy knew the vet and would call a vet. Okay. Yeah, we didn't have a vet that lived on the farm. Now, was there a physician on the property? No. No. If somebody got sick, Daddy would take them. So there was just other foremen on the property? Yeah. Did you interact with them and their families? Oh, yeah. You know, some of them had kids. So. There weren't that many kids who assisted, you know, periodically, whoever was the assistant at the time. They had children. There weren't a lot. I don't think there were more than three to seven of us all together. So we'd ride bikes and play cowboys and Indians and that sort of thing. Right. And play all the games that kids don't even know what they are now. Mm -hmm. AI and red light. <laughs> oh, I know those names. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, how did the other... You, you've done a good job of um, telling us how your father interacted with the inmates. How did the other staff interact with the inmates? Was it about the same? I would say it was about the same. Um, uh, I never really saw the interaction that much. I remember going to the dairy a couple times uh, with, with Daddy and the dairy herdsman. The dairyman was there, and he was a dog. You know, I just adored him. And, uh, I think he, they probably all interacted the same way. I think Daddy, if they had staff meetings, which I'm sure they did, really impressed it upon everybody who was working there that these men were treated with dignity, that were doing a job, that were working for them. And uh, I think that was instilled in me when I became a nurse. Right. I never told people what to do. I would ask them to do it mm -hmm. for me because it was my job. They were just helping me. Right. I think this is the way Daddy was, too. And uh, there were never any... There were never any... Uh, you know, fights or, or prison uprisings okay. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Not on the farm. Okay. Would you please describe mm -hmm. race relations on the farm? I have no. I'm, ass, I'm assuming that they weren't segregated in the dorm. Uh, there were. I don't know what the percentage of blacks and whites. There were no Hispanics back then, Mexican, mm -hmm. uh, Italians, or Cubans, or something. No, I mean, we just didn't have it. This is in the 40s and 50s. I don't. I really don't know if they were segregated. I doubt it because the main prison was segregated at this time, um, and the, none of the uh, people who worked there were as far as the, uh, on the farm. Okay, so. There wasn't a problem back in those days. What about within the community? Was there any issues with race relations? No. Remember, this is the 50s. Right. Uh, there were no problems okay. as far I mean, you know, we had black schools and we had white schools. Mm -hmm. It never dawned on me that when I would see the black school bus go down flight shows, it never dawned on me that it was going to a school. Right. But I mean, Ignorance is bliss, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the black people who lived in the Pantersville area, uh, there were so few that really there were no race relation problems. Right. You know, I mean, it was, there were some people who were on flat shells road, uh, babysat for another a couple times who were black, one lady and another. 
ironed clothes together when they were both pregnant. The mother was pregnant with me, and the lady came over and she said she was pregnant and she couldn't get a job, and the mother needed her to do anything. Like I said, if you'll bring an iron board, we'll iron together. And so Alberta and mother set the ironing board up and then blessed Alberta's heart. Mother had me, and then about uh, two weeks before that, or a week before, Alberta had twins. <laughs> And she brought the twins over, and they laid all three of us on the bed, and Mother and Alberta would, would iron together. That's the only kind of racial relations I know of. There was, no, there was no problem because there was no problem. Now, did you have any other interaction with the twins as you were growing up, or was that just something that timed out? That was just something that happened out. then, but Mother was from Pennsylvania, because I remember, I think Mother told me, and... You know, I would be all quoted on this, even though I'm talking to tape recorder, that uh, a couple people couldn't believe that she had all three of us on the bed together. Mm -hmm. And this mother wasn't used to segregation at all, and she said, well, where did you want me to put Susan? On the floor? You know. <laughs> so, but no. No, there was nothing. What about life on the farm as a Jewish family or in the community? In the community... We were the only Jews. Now, the lady whose farm adjoined ours, the husband one, she was Jewish and he wasn't. The girls were raised Jewish. They went to Southeast to camp. I don't know what their feelings. Well, I do, but I would express it. it I had no problem. I was a geek. I was a nerd. Um, I didn't date except maybe... I could count them. Everybody laughs when I said, well, I had a date with so-and-so and so-and-so. They go, did you date more than that? No, I had one date with this guy. One. But um, I didn't feel any kind of, of um, anti-Semitism. Uh, I do know that this one, one friend of mine, I mean, we're still all friends, who told me that he had two dates with me. I only remember one. <laughs> Said to, and he said the second time he came home and his mother was standing on the front porch with the Bible in her hand talking in tongues. <laughs> and uh, daddy, and, and so we didn't have any more dates. Daddy did not like the idea of my dad with anybody who was not Jewish. Right. Consequently, since I didn't know any Jewish kids except Sunday school once a week and they all went to the Westminster Party on the north side. <laughs> and so I really didn't date anybody. But there was no anti Semitism except little pockets here or there, and I will not talk about that. No problem. Yeah. Um, what about any issues that your father or mother may have had having been Yankees coming down to the South? Mother had one. Oh, Yankees coming to the South. Mother was scared to death. She didn't know it farther than Philadelphia, and she lived in, um, she lived, she was raised on the farm too, but it was Pennsylvania Dutch country, so it was, everything was pristine, and, and farm row, you know, the, the rows of corn were straight, no matter the shape of the land, and I remember that Daddy was driving her down here, and here it is, 1941, and he would point to some tobacco shack. I don't know if you know what a tobacco shack is, where they drink, like an old house that's fallen apart, and they hang tobacco in okay. it to dry. He would point to a tobacco shack. No doors, no, you know, the windows are all up. And he'd say, our house is just a little bit better than that one. And Mother was just freaking out, you know. Because <laughs> she had never seen a house that had not been painted before. Mm -hmm. Because everything in Pennsylvania is pristine. Right. And, uh, but that Mother was very nervous, and, and, but Daddy had already been here for a few months. And then she was pleasantly happy <laughs> when she got here. Um, did you experience any events associated with the civil rights movement being so close to Atlanta? No. No? The only thing that I know since I graduated in 1961 is that were a couple of my classmates whose parents were really young, and then I know a couple of them, whose parents pulled them out of school um, and sent them to private prep schools because of integration. But since I graduated in 61, it was all, this was all before the right. civil rights stuff occurred, and it's terrible to say, but I mean, I just never experienced gangs or marches or anything. 
you know, I did meet Mr. King and I did meet Mrs. King because they both used St. Joseph's. And uh, I met him when he was uh, uh, nominated. Um, he was in the hospital when he found out about his nomination for the New York Police um, and, and then I met, I, I met Mrs. King a couple of times and I don't want to discuss it. No problem. Yeah, she was <laughs> extremely um, snobby. Okay. Is there anything that stood out about your meeting Mr. King? Oh, I remember he was in his pajamas in the bathroom. <laughs> No, it's just, he wasn't as big then. Mm -hmm. I do not, you know, I mean, really, he was Martin Luther King from Atlanta, Georgia. Right. Um, I know that our rabbi was very involved with civil rights, Rabbi Rothschild. And he and Mr. King, Mr. King and a, a few of the other ones who are a little old and decrepit now were really um, big on civil rights. But here I was at 10th grade, and we didn't have anything going. Right. I'm sorry. You know, it's really a shame because I went, I went, I went and saw the movie The Hell. And I thought it was beautiful, and it was well acted, and I was so embarrassed. Especially about, you've seen it. No, I haven't. You have to see it. Okay. Especially about living in the South. I mean, this was exaggerated. It was in Mississippi or something. And it was exaggerated and stuff. But it was embarrassing. Because that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. As far as the people that owned the houses and people that worked in the houses. But we didn't have anybody working in the house, you know, and we only had the prisoners around. And uh, so I didn't experience that. Any, I think I experienced less of, of the black-white problem, if that was if it's called a problem, living on the farm than if I lived in the community because I wasn't raised with parents and grandparents and great-grandparents right. who used the N-word. I never used it. Right. Uh, I was taught to say color. You know, that's what it was back then. And so, and my parents all went to school with blacks and mother went had there were Indians in her class, American Indians. So, I didn't experience it as much as the people who lived in the surrounding area. Right. That makes sense. And there was definitely no difference between black and white on the farm, as far as as far as I knew, and I know as far as Daddy was concerned. Okay. When did your family leave the farm? Daddy retired in 1961, so he was there for 20 years, and then we actually moved. I don't know exactly when we moved, but I remember we moved to a house on Homewood Road, on Cindy Drive, and it was before I graduated, and I know that he graduated, and then he retired in 61. Okay. The difference between 41 and 61. I would say so. <laughs> How do you feel about growing up on a farm rather than a more urban environment? Oh, gosh, I loved it. You know, I mean, well, I don't know if I did things because... I was just there on the farm because it was the 40s and the 50s. Right. But, you know, we didn't tele we didn't have a television until the early 50s, so you did things outside. Um, I, my brother had not a weak stomach, but he wasn't into animal stuff. And um, Daddy, sometimes Daddy would take me to the piggery, which he had, he designed that piggery. Okay. Um, it didn't work out the way he wanted to, but he decided. And he, it'd be late at night, and he knew that a sow was going to be into labor that night. And he would always have somebody there when they were in labor. But, of course, during the day, he could have the prisoners there. But at night, he would not let anybody go. So he and I would go, mm -hmm. and we would deliver pigs. Now, I wouldn't be inside with the pig because they're big. But the pigs would come out like little sausages, you know, maybe 12, 13, 14. And Daddy would... You know, separate it like you're pulling the hot dog links apart. And I would clean it off and put it in another area because Daddy devised a system where the, once the babies were born, you couldn't, it was real easy for the mother pig to turn over and break and kill them. Okay. So what Daddy would do is he, he built this little thing where he would put the babies in this little thing and they could actually get to the mother, get the warmth, get the milk, but she couldn't turn over on it. Okay. So that's what he did. Hmm. So I delivered pigs. <laughs> Is that why you became a nurse? I don't know why I became a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Uh, have you been back to the farm since? I, I was. I went through the farm about five, six years ago to go to the to our neighbors who lived, whose farm adjoined. Uh, but uh, it was just still working good. It was um, since I was never since I never wandered through the buildings before. There was no reason for me to do it then. You know, it's right. like if your mother says don't touch that, right. you don't ever touch it, you don't. And I was never told I could because I did have interaction with the prisoners. Mm -hmm. You know, the garbage man would come over, right. gave me a ride on the truck a few times. One time mother had to make a quick trip with either a sick animal or a sick brother or some sort of animal. Um, and I couldn't go or something. And she asked the garbage man, you know, will you watch Susan for an hour while I'm gone? And I rode in the truck. And Mother felt perfectly safe with him, and I did too. <laughs> and I remember his name. He was from New York. Okay. I know um, it's been a few years since you've been to the site, so you can't comment on the current state of the site, but how did you feel about the state of the site when you saw it five or six years well, ago? Well, nothing ever stays the same, but it was disappointing that our house had been torn down and the other four were still up. And, you know, I always long for something that was there and isn't, including boyfriends, you know. Uh, I went back to my college, and they had paved all the little dirt paths, and, and and my dorm had been burned down, and they rebuilt it and named it the same thing, and I went, they can't name it the same thing. Right. So nothing ever stays the same. So there is that nostalgia. Mm -hmm. But um, that's change. You know, that's right. change. I think we had more fun back then. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really did. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Oh, yeah. Sounds like you did. We had fun. Do you are you familiar with Scott Peterson? The only Scott Peterson that I know of is the one who was in California. Who came oh no, not that one. No. <laughs> then I so you're not, <laughs> so you're not familiar with um, S T O P F, the Save the Old Prison Farm group? No, I'm not. Okay, well, Scott Peterson has started a group called Save the Old Pr Prison Farm. Does he mean the honor farm or the county farm? Well, see, that's the thing. Um, the way they describe in the articles that I've read, um, the, the layout, it sounds like it would be the old one. Because there's farm. right yeah, because okay. when I drove past your site, there's not really much to save from what I can see. It could be now the one, the county farm I believe is on Key Road, right? <coughs> Excuse me, and that's where the because it's city property. That's where they buried the uh, the elephants, the, the elephants that have died. From the zoo. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had elephants roaming around. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, because I remember when the, the, elef the first elephant died, um, his name I can't remember, Coco, I believe. Anyway, and all the school kids raised money to buy another elephant. Mm -hmm. and then they, but I remember when that elephant. But I, I think that's the county. Okay. I've lost a you might be right. Uh, I think that's the county. Okay. Because I don't know what they could do as far as the... Well, the federal has sold it, so... Right. I don't know. How did your father feel about the farm? Did he continue to talk about it after he left the farm? Can you, can you tell how he felt about it? Daddy wasn't that tough. He felt like, did he feel nostalgic? Oh, uh, did when he when he left there was it did he consider it like well that was my job now it's over or did did do you think that he continued to think about the farm? Well, I don't think he continued to think about the farm. My daddy retired. He went to work for uh, uh, Alternate Foods, and he was uh, since he had his degree in animal husbandry and, and was really unbelievably smart. Uh, he he developed food products for animals. I don't think he missed getting up at four in the morning and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, he never talked about missing the farm. Okay. Just like I don't think he would talk about missing the city when he left New York. He went on to something else. But he always worked with with food and animals and mm -hmm. you know, developed the, the dog food and the cat food that came out with all the foods when they first started making. He worked with Truett Kathy. Okay. Mm -hmm. who that is. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. Um, 
Chick-fil-A. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. And they helped. They were working together in making some sort of machine that would rip the chicken off chicken bone, of chicken necks. Interesting. Because, I mean, it's hard to get chicken. Mm -hmm. and I know that he and Drew and Kathy were, were pretty good friends as far as working on things together. Right. Um, so I don't think you could say he missed the farm. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know that you said when you went to the site a few years ago and you saw that your house was gone. Yeah, my house was gone. You were pretty saddened by that. Yeah. Um, when I went by there, I saw that there is still what seems to be the dairy barn. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything else. It doesn't mean nothing else is there. I, could, I couldn't see anything else. So, um, with your sentiments about your house having been demolished, what do you think should happen to that barn? Or anything oh, else that might be on the side. The only reason I was disappointed the house had been taken down was that the other four were left, and I wanted to show my son where I used oh, to live. Okay. And I went, this is what, no, I didn't live in that big apartment building. I said, oh, mm -hmm. well, the, the house that was next to it, you know, there were three on one side and two on the other. When I was born, Mother and Daddy originally lived in the house next to the house that we lived in because that was where the dairyman lived at the time, which is what Daddy was hired as. Okay. He was assistant farm manager, but was hired as the dairy. And then, before I was three, probably when I was about two something, something was bitten me up. Um, he moved into the manager's house because he became a manager. We've got pictures of me in front of the house that we lived in that I was born, quote, born in, but mm -hmm. I wasn't born there. But I don't remember living there. So the first house I ever lived in was still there. But I just wanted to show my son, this was the house All I right. lived in in Oregon. That's the one they tore down. Right. No, I don't feel bad about it. I could only draw a blueprint of it right now if I had to. Right. With closets and everything. It was considered a real pretty house at that time. Mm -hmm. um, it, most of the houses, it was before any of the houses in Tony Valley were built. And the houses before that were the 40s type houses. This house was built somewhere in the 30s. And um, for that area, it was a very nice house. Nobody had two bathrooms. Right. I think the Mathis is dead. The Mathis dairy. Nobody had two bathrooms. Or a two car garage. Yeah, they didn't have a garage. They <laughs> parked the car out front. Right. You know? But yeah, it was, I would consider them really nice. He was probably at least, well, I was a little girl in your eyes, you know, you see things through. I would say the house was at least 2,000 square feet. Wow. Yeah, it could have been smaller because everything looked bigger to me. Mm -hmm. Right. We had chandeliers in the dining room and, uh, and in the living room, you know, there was uh, some sort of, we didn't have it back then, we didn't have that back then. Right. Especially houses that were built in the 30s out in the country. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. Yep. So that concludes the questions that I prepared for the interview. Is there anything more that you'd like to add? Oh. <laughs> uh, I can't think of anything. You know, it was, as, in a summary, I would say it was a great place to live. I am sure, as far as anti-Semitism, that there was some. Uh, like I said, you know, there were a couple instances not on the farm, but in the area that mother endured, and that my brother endured. I'm sure I did, but I was too oblivious. You know, like you can't date her because she's Jewish. I never felt that. Um, as far as the farm was concerned. Uh, I interacted as much as I think my father let me interact. I remember when they would move the cows from one pasture to the other, from the pasture behind the house to the pasture on the other side of the road, there was that cattle thing where you could run them through and they would, daddy would let me watch, you know. And um, there was always one of the managers there. The, the piggery was a work of art. I think it's in ruins now. Mm -hmm. And Daddy knew that, um, I think what was cute is Daddy knew that pigs are very clean. They really are. You know, the only way they can sweat is to roll in mud, you know, like elephants. But they're very clean. They will only go use the bathroom in one particular place. So Daddy got the smart idea when he was building the piggery to having it built that he would cordon off a section of each, whatever it was, area 
where the pigs were living with like an area where they could go. Mm-hmm. And their attitude was, we don't want that area. And they picked the opposite corners. <laughs> but they were using the opposite corners. And right. they just cracked up. <laughs> but, you know, he would go down certain times to feel, you know, the, what I'd call the baby, well, younger pigs, the ones that were, you know, a couple of feet, mm-hmm. you know, the weaned pigs. And um, he would go take me with them and we would, you know, throw the food out to him so he had to feed them. And, um, and then when he, he was weaning pigs very early, it was another thing that Daddy did that was innovative at the time. And uh, he wanted to get them weaned as soon as possible. So within 24 hours of being born, he would make some sort of formula concoction and we would start, we'd poke their noses in it. You know, they'd lick their noses and whatnot. So Daddy could have the pigs weaned within probably a, a three to week, days to a week. Wow. So they would be eating out of a little dish. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought that was smart. You know. Yeah. And this was before the days of artificial insemination. So, uh, well, they might have done it, but, you know, it wasn't routine. Right. I remember when Daddy would throw a bull occasionally, you know, right. and do it. But it was really nice, you know. I think it was funny when Daddy was talking about this, in this magazine article about the far, the, the prisoners would make booze out of anything. Because I remember walking, going behind the, the garage one time, and I thought what I found. I thought I found a rabbit hutch. And I keep running to the house, and I said, there's the coolest rabbit hutch. Well, I didn't say cool. I said, there's a neat rabbit hutch behind. In the, we had a lot of bamboo behind the house. And Daddy went back there, and it was apparently a still, and they had saved their peaches. <laughs> they had saved their peaches from lunch or whatever, and they were making a still back there. Oh, wow. But like Daddy said, they could make it out of a chair leg. <laughs> That's too were, funny. Well, they knew how to do it. Mm-hmm. You know. Very smart. Just need to redirect their I think energy. that the prisoners were probably disappointed because he was very humane and he was very cognizant of, of, of providing dignity and um, to, to the other, to men. I mean, they knew that he was the boss and they knew they were in prison, but he gave them, they, they had as much dignity as they could have. Okay. On behalf of the DeKalb History Center, I'd like to thank you for your time and your contribution to the preservation of DeKalb's history. Well, you're quite welcome. And now I feel like the old person who is in <laughs> like Avery Witt, you know, Avery White. You know him, don't you? No. He's sort of like the unofficial historian of Panthersville. He's oh, got all this well, history. I need to write that down. You need to get on Facebook. I do need to do that. I hear only thing you have to do, his name is Robert Avery. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he is related to everybody in Panthersville. The stories he puts in about everything that's gone on down there are hysterical. You know, his his daddy owned the barbecue joint there. I mean, we all know, you know, we all know the same stuff. We're like intertwined. He's done a tremendous amount of genealogical, genealogical work there. And in fact, I wrote him one time and I said, Avery, and I only know him through Facebook. I do remember him when he was like two years old. Um, and I said, Avery, when you've done all this genealogical work, I said, have you ever found where people have married their cousins without realizing it? And he said, yeah. He said, after the fourth time, my daddy looked at me and said, son, it's time to quit looking. <laughs> but his father was the, was the bootlegger. Oh, okay. And uh, he, he actually bootlegged until he could sell alcohol in DeKalb County. And he just, Avery writes the greatest stories. You know, he was in Vietnam. He's the only person that, that took, that wrote a diary over there in Vietnam and cried. Mm. And uh, he's got a lot of time right now because he's got 5,000 diseases from, from Vietnam. Right. Chronic fatigue really badly and all these other kinds of mm-hmm. problems. So he is basically an invalid except if he saves up his energy and go out for a day. Oh. I think he graduated 64 or 65, something like that. But Avery has just done it. All this, he interviewed back in the 70s when he came back from Vietnam. He, um, or the early 70s, he went and started interviewing all the old people. 
And plus, nobody could drive by that time because they were so old. So Avery would take them to the doctor and take them here mm -hmm. and take them there. And he got bookies of information. And, and he also worked a lot with Franklin Garrett. I know you've heard of Franklin Garrett. Mm -hmm. And um, he worked with Franklin Garrett. And they talked something that's bit me on my ankle. I'm very sorry. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, He's a great one to talk about the whole of Catherine'sville okay. and that area of the Camp County. Mm -hmm. and I tell you who else knows a tremendous amount. It's Jack Mathis from Mathis Dairy. Mm -hmm. um, Jack has a lot of old pictures. You know, so he'll tell you that if somebody is doing the genealogy of that area, you know, when his father started dairy. He actually, they didn't have a phone because the phone line hadn't run, been run out to the dairy yet or to that area off Rainbow Drive, mm -hmm. which his father named Rainbow Drive. Because oh. he said when he built the dairy, it was the end of his reign. Wow, I See, never knew that. You never knew that. And that's why it was named Rainbow Drive. And so what he would do, there was a lady who lived off Glenwood. And so she would take all the phone orders for milk and whatnot. And Mr. Mathis would get on a horse and ride from Mathis Dairy. You know where it was. He would ride over to Glenwood. I'm sure cut through the back or whatever, that Columbia or whatever. And uh, get the order and then go back. And finally, he strung up. He put the poles up and had, he said, if I put the poles up, well, Georgia Power string or Southern Bell, whatever, string up some lines. And they did, uh, that's how he got phone lines to Mathis Dairy. Unbelievable when you look at Rainbow Drive and you now. Forget, you forget that they stuck there before. Like right by the river, South River, and mm -hmm. you know, Panthersville Road. Right at the river, there was, you know, I'm sure it looks different now. There was this thing that we always call the Indian Flat ground and this big. We said it was an Indian. Well, Daddy at one time told us that he had had somebody come out and check it and there was nothing in it. Hmm. But of course, back then, they didn't have the machinery and they right. didn't tear it down. <coughs> and I'm, I'm sure that that big mound, whatever, I mean, it was big enough that you noticed it. Right. And, you know, I was talking to Don about it last night and I said, he said, you know, and tell her about the Indian mound. And I said, but. Daddy said there wasn't anything there. He said they didn't dig all the way into it. He said, I am sure that either it was used on top for something. Because all that land was lower. Right. It's bottom land. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows what bottom land is now. But that's all bottoms. And then there was this big thing, and it was right by the river. I would say maybe, as, as in not a football field, so that's a, I had to measure everything in a football field. Uh, I would say... 50 yards at the most off the uh, off the road was this Indian man. That's cool, but you've got to, you, you know there was a lot of uh, the Creek Indians lived there. Right. Don used to go around. He didn't have to dig down two feet. He would just push the leaves aside, and you could find Indian arrowheads. Hmm. It never dawned on us. We're finding arrowheads here because there were Indians here before and all the Greeks lived there. Right. We've heard two different stories about when they were moved off. And that was either 1842, when the courthouse burned down. That sounds familiar. Or it was earlier, like 1819. So I don't know, but you forget that there were things underneath your feet. Right. And like when the whole time, I went to Emory Oxford. It never occurred to me to, to, to go look at stuff. Right. And that's a phenomenal place. Mm -hmm. And we knew that this building was used as a hospital during the war between the states, and this one was too. But it didn't register with us. Right. The only thing that registered was when I went back and I went, oh, they partitioned all the rooms off and they've uh, plastered the walls. And I remember looking at wooden walls and wooden floors and the third floor was condemned and now it's a, a floor. And how we used to drag things up there like cows. <laughs> and they put a zebra up there. Did you hear that? They put two zebras up there. Yeah. 
Yeah, somehow they, some guy in a farm with zebras, and the next thing we knew, they had, it's a tradition in Oxford. Oh, I see. To put things at Halloween on the third floor of City Hall, which was built in 1834 or something, whenever the school was started. And it's the administration building, and it's all historical stuff. And I remember the guys driving cows up there when I was a senior, you know, when I was a, a freshman. But they put a zebra up there. And then they put goats up there, too. Is that your daughter? No. Um, okay, well, we'll conclude the interview here. Okay. I appreciate you, Wendy Jabber. I appreciate